with a string of extra-dimensional crises and paranatural occurrences, sometimes the day-to-day -day lives of the agents can go forgotten. Remedy created this setting to be both fantastical and remarkably grounded at the same time. Several of the documents lying around the oldest house include stories of disappearing restrooms, issues with the mail being lost in other dimensions, or whether time dilation in certain realities qualify for overtime pay. These, along with dozens of others, make the Federal Bureau of Control feel like a real workspace. Sometimes these documents are there to create a certain mood or flavor for the setting. Other times, these seemingly innocuous notes may hint at something bigger. The Bureau's Book Club is one of these subplots. While there are likely more members, the only ones we know of are Penny Bartwell, Philip Filson, Captain Lopez, and a man named Samson. Penny appears to be the ringleader of this little group. Because of the Hiss invasion, I doubt they meant to discuss Unless You by J.D. Brooks. If they had, they would have realized that even though Penny gave out the same book, the story was different for all of them. This reminds me of the events of the never-ending story. The text of the book would change based upon the reader. At the start of the story, Bastian suffers a loss in his family, so the story wrote itself to reflect his feelings about the situation. Just like his mother died of a mysterious disease, the Empress had fallen ill from an unknown affliction. The protagonist, Atreyu, acted as his fictional avatar and was tasked with finding a cure. In a way, the book became Bastion's fantasy of curing the illness that killed his mother. Just like we read a book, the book can read us as well. We can project ourselves onto the characters and some of the story's events onto our lives. In the same manner, Unless You wrote itself differently based upon the reader. The trouble, however, is that it didn't only shift to match the reader, but made predictions about their future. To see exactly how this presents in the game, let's learn a bit about the book club members as well as the version of the story they read. Before starting, I want to take a second and discuss the etymology of the word avatar as I will be using it throughout the video. From the Sanskrit word avatarana, it refers to the descent of a deity into an earthly, incarnate form. In essence, an avatar refers to the manifest embodiment of something abstract. Ati may be the avatar of something greater. Dylan becomes the avatar of the Hiss once he's corrupted. When reading a book, the reader is an abstract concept from the perspective of the characters. Atreyu doesn't understand who or what Bastion is, but after looking into the magic mirror gate, he learns he is the avatar of a boy reading in a school attic. L. Samson is the first of the members that Jesse comes across. His version of the book presented itself as a science fiction space opera. The conflict centered around two factions, one that he referred to as space hippies, and the other a warfaring race known as the Fixers. For him, it mostly predicts the Hiss invasion. The assault on the city planet using brain worms reminds me of a line from the Hiss chant, an earworm is a tune you can't stop humming in a dream. Samson expresses frustration that his favorite character was killed less than halfway through. The cause of death involves a gravitational anomaly sending a battery cylinder into the character's face. Oddly enough, when Jesse first sees Samson, we witness a battery fly from an opening at him. We bear witness to Samson's death in the same way as his favorite character in the book. Upon looking inside, we learn the floppy disk OOP is causing the gravitational anomaly and begins throwing batteries at Jesse as well. The book predicted future events as well as the death of the reader. Much like what Atreyu was to Bastion, the character in Samson's copy of Unless You became his avatar within the story. When picking a favorite character, there are a few factors that help unconsciously guide our choice. Mostly, it comes down to two primary factors. One, they remind us of ourselves. The reader sees a character that goes through the same struggles as them that have similar personal convictions, or has a similar background. In this way, we can fully empathize with this character and become invested in their journey. The other reason is because they represent an ideal they wish to embody. We admire the characteristics that we wish to embody in real life, but don't. So we are allowed to live vicariously through the character and join them on their journey. The next member of the book club is Lopez, a squad captain assigned to the Rangers. For her, Unless You becomes a dystopian romance novel. 
It involves a virus called The Fix, which is spreading across the world. Even though Samson's version involved an alien race known as the Fixers, both the virus and alien species refer to the Hiss. As a ranger, her specialty is leading expeditions into the thresholds of the oldest house. The main character, who acts as her avatar in the story, goes on expeditions into dangerous and uncharted territories. The story ends with the main character succumbing to the Fix virus and sending her love interest on to save the world. However, we never learn if it actually does. This exactly parallels Captain Lopez's fate when she is sent on a routine expedition to the formation in the quarry. At Quarry Site Beta, her squad is attacked by the Hiss and her final broadcast is to tell others to stay away. Lopez's words in her book review sum up the scene. She goes out into the unknown, alone and surrounded by danger, but never loses sight of the goal. That is a good soldier's death. Her projection upon the book presents itself in two separate ways. One, her military mindset, always focused on the mission even in the face of death. The other is one that many can relate to. She states that the people all lived in walled cities now because dystopian future, which possibly refers to her feelings of being trapped either within the oldest house, her mind, or both. For some of these agents, the house likely consumes their lives, both professionally and personally. One must keep themselves walled off from those outside of the bureau they meet. Even though her report spoke of a disconnection from the plot's romance storyline, she imprinted onto the book, so there must be some symbolic relevance for her. Humans are social creatures, and we desire companionship. Whether that be among friends, family, or a romantic partner, people need people. In her case, it feels like she desires a connection outside of the weirdness of the Bureau, but can never have it. There is a parallel here between Lopez and her avatar's final act. The character commands her love interest to go on and save the world giving up on the promise of love for the sake of the mission. Lopez also accepted her fate. She knows this is the end for her, but that the job can still be done. The message she leaves before the hiss get her is addressed to anyone from the Bureau who may find the audio log. Protecting the oldest house and the agents inside take priority. The mission comes first. The final member of the book club is the MVP of the containment sector, Philip Filson. Being an avid fan of horror, unless you wrote itself with that genre in mind, his is the most overt example of how the book reflects his own life and the meta nature of the Remediverse in general. In his words, the characters even comment on it, saying how their lives felt out of control, as if they were just programmed to perform the same empty actions over and over. In a literal sense, this is true. The NPCs in the game are programmed with the same idle animations and voice lines. This makes me flash over to Max Payne, where on two separate occasions his mind tried to tell him that he is inside of a video game. The monster of Philip's copy of the book is called The Fix. Unlike the others who both would go on to deal with the hiss directly, The Fix represents the former. Stuck on fridge duty, he is forced to watch the Arctic Queen to ensure it doesn't lash out. This is identical to his avatar, who is instructed to watch the monitors for what feels like the rest of his life. In his report, he condemns the character for blindly following orders during what he calls a horrible slaughter fest. However, when it came to the Hiss invasion and him being forced to watch the fridge, he did the exact same thing, sat there and followed orders. Just like his avatar's fate was left ambiguous, the same is true for Phil's. Even though there's blood splattered on the floor, his book report leaves it up in the air. He wonders about the character. Did the fix get him? Is he dead? Did he end up in a parallel reality with the others? We don't know, and that's okay. I believe the overt references by Phil here regarding the meta nature of his story is relevant. This is because in this setting, there is a direct link between fiction and reality. We see this in the book club the relationship between Alan Wake and his writings, and the effect of urban legends on collective consciousness. Literature allows us to forget about the world and ourselves, and project it down into the world of fiction. Sometimes, we can even be changed by it. One method is called perspective taking. Closely aligned with empathy, it is where the reader allows themselves into the mind of the characters. In this manner, we can see things from a perspective other than our own. 
The other is called experience taking. Whether consciously or unconsciously, sometimes we take aspects of the characters and incorporate them into our own lives. Depending on the story, these changes can be beneficial or detrimental to the reader. A quote from Jeff Kaufman and Lisa Libby's paper entitled, Changing Beliefs and Behavior Through Experience Taking, they describe it better. Readers simulate the events of a narrative as though they were a particular character in the story world. Adopting the character's mindset and perspective as the story progresses rather than orienting themselves as an observer or evaluator of the character. The greater the ability of a reader to simulate the subjective experience of a character, the greater the potential that story has to change the reader's self-concept, attitudes, and behavior. Unless you took this concept to the extreme and the experiences of the characters literally reflected itself on the fates of the book club members. Why this book has the power is unknown. Penny Bartwell originally gave this book out. Over the course of her duties as the head of the Dead Letters Archive, she discovered the Moving Letters altered item. It is possible that over the course of her duties, she came across another altered item that was this book by J.D. Brooks. I wonder what happened to it during the Hiss invasion and whether it will ever be found again. Lost somewhere in the oldest house, waiting to be read. <laughs> Oh, my God.